Thank you, Father. So um, my paper today will be based largely on my doctoral dissertation on the Moscow Synod of 1917 1918. The sources were collected mainly from the Russian Federation State Archive and the Russian Historical State Archive. But in the beginning, let us go to Byzantium for a brief moment. Likely sometime in the 11th century, a legal case was judged by a senior judge in Byzantine Emperor, Eustatios Romeos. The case was recorded along with numerous other verdicts in a legal collection, the so-called Pira. In the case, a widow was charged in the court with adultery. Making clear what the law says, Eustatios finalized his decision to dismiss the charge of adultery by quoting some lines of Homer, verses from Odyssey, where Athena is urging Telemachus to return <clears throat> to return home to Ithaca before his mother Penelope will choose a new husband in place of Odyssey. Some 900 years later, in Moscow, a notable Russian professor of canon law, Ilya Gromoglasov, during one of the sessions of the Old Russian Church Council, stated, and I quote, in front of us are, on the one hand, cries and sorrow coming from life, and the other, certain requirements of canonical antiquity. I think both Estadio's judgment and Gromoglasov's contemplation serves an excellent entry into our subject, namely, how the Church will appeal to its early norms and practice when creating or revising degrees and regulations, in our case, divorce and marriage ones. From the time of Peter the Great to the, to the beginning of 20th century, Russian divorce law was stricter than in ancient Rus Russia. The Holy Synod had a key role in this process. The state granted divorces only in cases when the Synod supported them. Hence, the religious institution of marriage was protected by the Russian judiciary during the entire 18th 19th and early 20th century. Over time, this bureaucratic movement of managing divorces, divorce cases led to marriage institution in the Russian Empire being placed in a state of crisis. The risk involved in getting married was too big, and the mass of people did not want to take the risk. This can be understood when the strict divorce laws are examined. By the Russian laws for the 20th century, marriage could be dissolved in case of proven adultery, premarital incapacity for a conjugal relationship, the sentence of one of the spouses, punishment or exile to Siberia, and the unknown absence of one of the spouses for at least five years. In 1913, among a population of almost 100 million Orthodox Christians, 3,791 divorce, divorces were sought and granted by the state. Mentioned ratio appears unrealistically low if compared to modern Russian statistics, where in 2016, more than 600,000 divorces were granted. The reduction of legal marriages, the increasing number of unlawful relationships and illegitimate births slowly affected the end of Russian society after the First World War. The question of legality or illegality of marriage was always subject to the ecclesiastical court. Our priest George Savelsky, who worked in the Holy Synod between 19 15, 1917, recalled the following in his memoir, and I, <clears throat> and I wrote, yes, the worst, case, the worst cases actually occupied the Senate in most of its meetings. 
In Chavez's opinion, before the revolution, divorce cases were dealt within a strange, strange, unnecessary, and pointless order in which all the cases from regional offices were submitted for approval to the whole Senate. In some dioceses, dioceses, the number of divorce cases reached up a thousand a year, and every year the number increased. The preparatory period of the Old Russian Church Council, which consisted mainly the years from 1906 to 1917, was reflected in the canonical debates of bishops and canon lawyers in theological publications and in the church press. Those involved were a full number of views and models for reforming Russia's obsolete divorce and marriage law. Reasons for an ecclesiastical divorce became one of the most important projects of the church council. Various plans to reform it continued to surface until 1916, after which they were introduced in the Old Russian Church Council. Besides the minutes of the meetings of the preconciliar period, there were a number of serious canonical studies on the subject of divorce. For example, Professor of Canon Law Ilya Derknikov approached the problem from ancient and contemporary viewpoints. <coughs> Because of the limitation of our time, I will summarize his views by saying that Professor Bernikov saw the importance of the Byzantine legal tradition for the future of Russian marriage law. He argued that when there was a question of improving some legal institution, whether in the field of public or private law, it was common to turn to the past of this institution to try to find out its legal nature and its historical forms of development. <clears throat> In his view, the Greek nomocanon gives instructions for almost all the private reasons for divorce which were debated in the early 20th century in Russia. Professor Bernikov suggested that during the grouping of reasons for divorce, especially if it was found necessary to increase the number of reasons for divorce, and to, in, and to introduce subdivisional categories for them, this should be done in the spirit of norms, norms which were already provided by the Byzantine laws. But there were also studies, for example, respected Russian canonist Nikolai Suvorov's one, which saw that the rules of the ancient church and the laws of the Byzantine emperors have already outlived their days and were not useful to modern condition of life anymore. To him, neither the church teaching on marriage as a sacrament, nor the canons of the Eastern church could serve as a basis for divorce law that would meet the needs and requirements of modern life. For these reasons, uh, Suvorov thought that carrying out such strictness within the contemporary discipline of church life would be impossible. He could not allow the inco incoherence which the drafters permitted the inco incoherence in Suvorov's opinion concerned circumstances in which a particular canon could be interpreted in the drafter's opinion to fit any engineer regulation, even if it was only partly suitable for, the, for that purpose. However, when the canon could, could not be directly used in the planner's regulation, it was not mentioned. One could apply this way of thinking, for example, to the case in which changing the five-year period of absence to three, year, three years was discussed. Such an economy could not be justified by the canons in Suvorov's, Professor Suvorov's opinion. 
So how the church constituted the motives for the solution of marriage in the Old Russian Church Council? In September 2nd, 1918, it was decided that the church tolerated the dissolution of marriage only in clemency for human weakness and concerns for people's salvation. A matrimonial union blessed by the church could be dissolved no way except by the decision of the church court. Divorce was possible only on duty proof occasion, which were in compliance with the grounds set in the following conciliary defined articles. First, apostasy, the orthodox faith, adultery and unnatural vices, incapacity for a conjugal relationship, Contracting, contracting of leprosy or syphilis, unknown absence, sentence of one of the spouses to punishment resulting in loss of civil rights and means of support, attempt upon the life of health of uh, spouse or children, illicit sexual relation, pimping and the manipulation of spouse state of need, bigamy, such probably proved in incurable mental illness was supposed that eliminated the possibility of continuation of marital life and malicious abandon abandonment of a spouse. Going some 80 years forward, the basis of social concept of the Russian Orthodox Church <coughs> promulgated new motives besides one previously accepted in 1918 for permitting divorce. These were contraction of AIDS, alcoholism, or chemical addiction proven by medical examination and abortion procured by wife without the consent of husband. Bishop's Council document of uh, 2017 did not specify any more diseases except an alcoholism, but spoke more generally regarding the illness of a spouse. <coughs> Russian Orthodox Church today admits 11 valid, one may say canonical, reason for permitting ecclesiastical divorce. The basis of social concept recalls that in marriage, preparation with young couples, it is important to emphasize the principle of the indecent in this availability of marriage, of marriage, as well as the fact that divorce is only an extreme solution and can only take place under the condition established by the church. The Russian church insists, and has always done so, that ecclesiastical divorce cannot be given lightly or as a mere consequence of civil divorce. It echoes the ancient principle that permits the, uh, the innocent party in a divorce to conclude a second marriage, while the guilty part, party may, done, may do so only after fulfillment depends. Recent norms of the Russian Orthodox Church leave it to the competence of the bishops to deal with the question regarding divorce and new marriages. <clears throat> Such work is done either by the Diocesan Ecclesiastical Court or by a special joint commission of Diocesan Bishop and Presbyters. Instead, <clears throat> instead of conclusion, I would like to emphasize that the transformation of the family in the 20th century of Russia created a situation in the state wherein canon lawyers started to demand the improvement of divorce regulation in order to respond to the needs of society within the frames of canonical norms of the church. If there's anything to be learned from the Russian experience of the mentioned period, it is that pro forma, compliance with legal requirements for solemnizing marriages in the church did not always result in happy marriages, nor did unhappy marriages end only after all the procedure for their dissolution were carried out. 
The Russian chose so it necessary to come back to the the worst question once more in the 21st century. The groundwork, however, for this was done at the preconciliar period in the 20th century. You may have heard only a fragment of this work today, but I strongly believe that it was a custom for this period to think that every law must be first defined by theological, canonical, and moral reflections in order to be fully recognized by the community of the faithful and by, and by the bishop of the church. The ideal purpose of every ecclesiastical law, in my opinion, should be such that the faithful can understand its true meaning and values. In this way, uh, in this way compliance with such law becomes a moral action in the mind of the faithful. Working with the old Russian Church Council documents in the Russian archives in St. Petersburg and in Moscow some years ago, I read some of its decrees with particular sadness, signs in these decrees only a few lines were dedicated to the question of indissolubility, while many, many subsequent, subsequent pages described the ways in which it was possible to dissolve the unbreakable bond. And with this, I rest my case. Thank you.